I often get asked if it is possible to create spatial audio with a regular digital audio workstation, one that is not capable of handling multi-channel audio. And the simple answer to that question is yes, it is. And it's actually fairly easy to do. And I'm going to show you today how to actually do that. Now, the door that I'm going to use today is Studio One. Why Studio One? Well, first of all, it's one of my favorite DAWs. I use it quite frequently, actually. And then I rarely get to use it in my videos. So I figured this might actually be a good time to use Studio One for a change. However, what I'm going to show you today works with pretty much any digital audio workstation. So if you're an Ableton user or a Bitwig user or a Logic user or a Cubase or Nuendo user or whatever user, what I'm going to show you today is something that you can directly apply to your workflow and get started with spatial audio. And with that being said, let's get right into it. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design and spatial audio. And if any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. An invite link is in the description below. And since you already added, it, please don't forget to press the like button because once again, YouTube wants us to do that. At this point, I would also like to give a big shout out to Lord Cannon. Lord Cannon is a regular viewer of this channel and a big contributor in my Discord community. And he was actually the one who pointed me to the solution that I'm going to talk about today. So thank you for that. Lord Cannon has his own YouTube channel. There's a link in the description below. I encourage you to click that link and watch his stuff. It's really, really interesting what he's doing. I'm going to start this video today with a little loop in Studio One. Now, if you have been following my channel, you're already familiar with this loop. That's something that I use quite often. It is a loop that comes with the demo bank of the Ubershall Elastic Player. And I like to use that because it has a very liberal licensing agreement. So that's something I like to use a lot. So let's just check how that sounds. So nothing particularly special, but something that we can uh, use in order to get started. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these individual tracks and we're going to convert them into spatial audio, or we're going to use them in order to create a spatial audio project. Studio One doesn't really have native support for spatial audio, obviously. So the first thing that we need is we need a tool, a plugin that can extend the capabilities of Studio One to include spatial audio. And the tool that we're going to use is called Space Lab Ignition. It comes from a company called Fiedler Audio. I'm going to post a link in the description below. Uh, there are essentially two versions of Space Lab. One is called Ignition. The other one is called Interstellar. Interstellar is more of a professional version of that tool that has a lot more capabilities than Ignition. For the purposes of this particular video, we are perfectly fine using Ignition. And if you are just trying to figure out if this is something that you want to do, then Ignition is certainly more than enough. So if you want to follow this video, I encourage you to go to their website, link in the description below, and download the trial and see if that's something that you're interested in. And once again, this is uh, not something that only works for Studio One. It actually works for pretty much any digital audio workstation. So I've tried it with Ableton, I've tried it with Bitwig, I've tried it with Cubase and it works perfectly fine. So let's get Spacelab into a little Studio One project. Now the basic workflow of, of uh, Spacelab is pretty similar to a Adobe Atmos workflow. So first of all, there's sort of a renderer plugin that sits on a bus. Uh, and this renderer plugin is the actual Spacelab Ignition plugin. And then we have individual plugins on the individual tracks that routes these tracks into that renderer plugin. So let's first get started with the renderer. So let's first add a bus to our tracks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all the individual tracks in my project, and I'm going to add a bus to the selected channels. Now, if you're working with Studio One, you could also use an effects track for the purpose. If you're working with another digital audio workstation, use whatever is appropriate there. If you're enabled, it would be a turn track. If you are in Cubase, it would be a group track. It needs to be a track where all the individual tracks are routed into. That's essentially the one thing that is necessary. So then let's add the uh, space lab ignition to the inserts of our bus. And I'm just going to search for ignition here. And here we are. And that opens up uh, ignition. And uh, currently there isn't really much going on here because the first thing that I need to do is I need to route all the individual tracks that I have in my project into this uh, Ignition plugin. The, the Ignition plugin works sort of like the renderer plugin in Dolby Atmos. It has the same functionality really. So let's uh, 
route all our tracks into that. So let's first start with uh, the first one. The first one is my kick and uh, snare track. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an insert and the insert I'm going to add is the Spacelab Beam plugin. Uh, the Beam plugin sort of beams the track into the renderer plugin or the ignition plugin. Uh, we need to give it a name, so let's call that kick. And, uh, and that's pretty much it uh, for now. So let's go back into our Spacelab Ignition plugin. And let's now take in that particular channel. Now the way to do that is to click on the little cogwheel here in the individual sources lab. Uh, and here we can sort of select what the input of that channel will be. So let's, let's uh, if, if we click on that, we essentially get all the options. Currently we only have one. We will add more later, but we currently have only one. We called it kick, so let's add the kick plugin. And uh, it will automatically name that. I can change the name if I want to, but that's fine. I also can change a color that will come in handy. So we probably need to change the color for the other tracks, but once again, going to do that in a second. And uh, once I've done that, essentially the uh, plugin or the track will be routed into Ignition and the panning will be done within the Ignition plugin. So let's have a brief listen on uh, if everything still sounds exactly the way it's supposed to sound. So let's just start that uh, playing here. So as we can now see, the, uh, the kick is already routed into the Ignition plugin. Uh, there is a reverb going on and I can, I can actually change the individual reverbs. We're going to kind of play around with that a little bit later. So there's some additional effects that I have here. Uh, but the first thing that I need to do is I really need to make sure that all my individual tracks are routed into. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simply do the same thing for all eight individual tracks that I have. So let's just do that one more time on screen and then I'm going to kind of cut out and kind of do that and come back. So let's just do that for the second one, which I think is the bass here. So let's add the beam plugin. And uh, in the beam plugin, let's call that the bass. And then let's go back into the Spacelab plugin. And in the Spacelab plugin, we add a source, we click on the cogwheel, we select the base, and uh, now we essentially have a second source in our ignition plugin. Now, the one thing that you will notice that if I do that, um, uh, essentially for the second source, the uh, the two channels uh, are, are sort of kind of put overlaid. So, so what the first thing you should probably do is kind of to just move them around a little so that they have a, be a better understanding of where everything is. And, uh, and uh, that will make it much, much easier because if you don't do that, all the sources are at the same point and it makes it a little bit complicated to see what exactly you're currently working with. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the same thing for the other six tracks and I see you in a second when I've completed the task. So I've now added all the individual Blim plugins and routed them into Spacelab Ignition. So let's have a look on how that looks. Well, first of all, each individual track now has this insert that is a Spacelab Beam insert. They all have their individual names and they're all routed into Spacelab Ignition. Let me just open up Spacelab Ignition here. And here are the individual sources that come from these individual Beam plugins. And I also distributed them a little, kind of moved them around in three-dimensional space to give it a little bit more of a spatial feeling. Uh, I also, if I go to the side panel, I also move them up and down a little so that we have a little bit of uh, variation in the up and down uh, field. And you can also you can also look at it from a three-dimensional perspective and can see that sort of how that how that looks. Um, now let's have a brief listen on how that actually sounds. Um, so let's start the let's start the little loop. Now the reverb is quite substantial at that point, but we can actually for each individual source, we can uh, select on how much of the effect we actually want. So if we go into the kick section, for example, we can here select uh, the dry wet knob. So let's move that down a little because that, that is actually quite substantial. So let's move that down to minus 40 and let's do the same thing for all the other ones. Just, just to get a little bit more of a regular feeling. Okay, the pads, yeah, the pads, is, uh, do, let's do the same thing for the pads, but doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But And you obviously can change that individually for each individual uh, source, for each individual object, but I'm simply going to uh, use almost the same for all of them. So let's let's have a second listen.
Now that sounds a lot more realistic. Now, if you don't like that particular reverb, obviously you can go to different types of reverbs. Uh, I'm just going to leave it the way it is for, the, for, this, for this video. Now, there's one additional thing that we can do. And uh, if we go into the reverb, this is the sources section where we can select and work with the individual sources that come through the individual Beam plugins. But if we go to the reverb uh, tab in the plugin, there's a second uh, part of this. What we want to do here is we also want to change the way we actually kind of monitor everything. And this is done here in the second part of this, uh, of this tab. Here we have uh, the way we can, uh, we can monitor everything. So what we can do, for example, is we can set the binaural monitoring, monitoring to uh, a binaural uh, algorithm. Now there are three different versions here. So let's just have a brief listen how that sounds. And then we can also change the output format. So even though uh, Studio One doesn't really allow us to work with multi-channel, the plugin internally can actually do that. So what we can do, for example, is we can select from the individual, oopsie, from the individual output uh, options that we have. We can, for example, select that we want to have a 32-channel layout uh, where we have all the speakers in a regular kind of sphere environment. And you can cho choose any, any layout that you want. Let's just, for the fun of it, let's just choose the one that has the most speaker or the most channels. Let's choose uh, 32, full, full sphere. And we now have the, the 32 individual channels that are going on here. Now at this point, you can essentially take space lab ignition in order to create soundscapes by moving sounds in three-dimensional space, playing around with the reverb and the individual effects and making sure that everything sounds good. But in the end, everything still has to go back to a stereo track because Studio One, once again, is natively a stereo door. So, so we have to convert it back into stereo. So the question is, can we uh, also export that in a native uh, spatial audio format? And the answer to the question is, yes, we can. And the way this is done by exporting through the MPEG-H exporter. Now, I have not yet talked that much about MPEG-H. MPEG-H is uh, sort of similar to Dolby Atmos in that it is a 3D audio standard or a kind of the, the 3D audio part of MPEG-H is a 3D audio standard. And uh, that is, that is object-based, so it has bad channels and it has object channels, so it's very similar to Dolby Atmos. However, there are a couple of differences, and I might actually do a video about the differences and similarities between MPEG-H and Dolby Atmos in the near future. Um, for now, the, one thing, the main thing that you need to understand is that uh, Dolby Atmos is a proprietary format, whereas MPEG-H is an international format, so many uh, developers actually prefer MPEG-H, but it has the same functionality. So let's see how we can add MPEG H exports to our little project here. And that's actually very simple to do. All we really need to do is we need to add the MPEG H exporter. Now the exporter is something that you can download from the Fiedler Audio website for free. Uh, so you don't have to pay for it, but it doesn't come included with the ignition. So you need to, it's an extra download that you need to do and, uh, and then essentially kind of install it on your system. And then as soon as you have installed it, it's essentially ready to go. So let's add the MPEG exporter to our little uh, project here. And the, uh, the way this is done is it has to be added after the ignition plugin. So let's add it right onto the bus here after the ignition plugin. Let's uh, search for MPEG H uh, exporter. And uh, this is sort of the MPEG H exporter. Currently it shows me an error simply because it uh, demands that the input the starting point and the end point of whatever it's going to export has to be, uh, essentially the starting point has to be in advance of the end point and that's not the case. So it shows me an error here, so don't worry about that too much. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to connect to our Spacelab instance. I didn't really give the Spacelab instance that I'm using a name, so it doesn't really show up here. I'm, all I really need to do is I need to, uh, to connect. And uh, as soon as I connect, if I click on that, I have all the individual sources here. Now, the first thing that I need to do is I need to select whether or not these sources uh, become objects in my export or if they are rendered into the bed. Uh, once again, MPEG-H is very similar to Dolby Atmos in that it has a bed and then individual objects. And I can now select whether or not the individual tracks that I'm having, that I'm routing into space lab ignition, will become objects or will be routed directly into the into the bed channel. And this is done by clicking on the separate button. So let's uh, let's click on that here. Um, now there are two different export versions. Uh, you can either export that in ADM or MPF format. Uh, for now, don't worry too much about it. What we're going to do is we're simply going to use the ADM format. 
because for reasons. Um, uh, so what we're going to say is we want the kick actually to be separated. We don't want to have that uh, mushed into the bed. We actually want those as separate as separate objects. Now, the one thing that you need to know is that when you're separating the uh, the, uh, the, the the source to become an object, um, and that's actually why it's called separation, um, the, the, the effects that are calculated are routed into the bed. So what we have now done is we have separated the object from its effects. The effects are routed into the bed, and the object are routed into individual object channels. And that's that's essentially why it's called separation. So let's go, uh, let's do the same thing for all the others as well. So let's do it for the base, uh, separate that one, and let's do it for the hi-hat. Separate that one. The keys, oops, the keys, let's separate that one. For some reason I clicked the mute button here, sorry for that. Uh, then uh, the pads are actually going to route into the bed. Um, so let's leave the beds in the bed and the synth, uh, I'm going to separate that out as well. And then essentially I have to uh, make, make a couple of selections in the actual exporter plugin. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to change the bed layout. Now. The bed layout by default is two channel. What I want to do is I want to have it a little bit immersive. However, there's one additional thing that I need to that I need to take care of. The first thing is that MPKG in contrast to Dolby Atmos has less channels available. So we in Dolby Atmos we have 128 channels that we can work with, and these 128 channels give us a lot of space for individual objects and MPEG H that is not the case. MPEG H comes in different versions and the version that we are dealing with here is a version that has an, a, a total of 15 channels available. Uh, and that essentially means that we can bump it up a little so we can, it doesn't have to be stereo, but we can't really bump it up to a 7.1.4 because then we would ex exceed the 15 channels that we have. So what we can do is, for example, we can bump that up to a 5.1 layout and then essentially we have 15 objects and that is uh, the, the maximum that we can use. Uh, in your project, if you want to do that, obviously you would kind of fold in or fold together certain objects to make sure that you're not exceeding this limitation of MPEG H. So the final thing that we need to do is is we need to um, set the, imp the the starting point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the cursor here and set the start, the input point and the end point. Let's do that at the end. Let's set the end point. And uh, then uh, let's uh, export the whole thing. So, so I'm going to set the cur cursor back to the starting point. And all I really need to do is I need to press the export button. Uh, it will then ask me to to uh, save the file or where to save the file, and then I need to play it. And it will uh, once I play it, it will actually export it. So let's do that. So I'm going to press the export button here, and uh, as soon as I do that, it tells me I would. I already did a couple, so let's let's call it test again. So it's going to be our test. Let's save that. Yes, I want to do that, and uh, then I'm going to. It says that I'm. It's ready. And I'm now going to play that uh, that loop, and uh, as I play that, it will actually export it. So let's let's play it. I'm not going to hear anything. That that is sort of silent. Everything is going into into exporting that. So let's let's just do that. And close. Okay, now we are done, and it's now exporting that. And and we are done. So let's uh, let's have a brief listen on uh, on how that actually sounds. Now the problem with that is that I can't really play that file on my Windows machine. In order to be able to do that, what I need is I need a special file, uh, a special tool that can actually play these types of MPEG H files. And this tool is something that you can download from the Fraunhofer website. I'm going to post a link in the description below. There is a tool that you can use. Um, it's called the MPEG H Authoring Suite. Uh, it's it's available for free, so you can download that. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, get immediate access. So what you need to do is you need to ask them to give you access. It usually takes a day or two, so so don't be don't be impatient. So you need it needs to take a little. So you need to kind of re register with them and then ask them. I, I'd like to download that, and then, then we'll actually check if you are eligible to download it, and then give you a download link. But once you've downloaded that, downloaded that, you will have um, an entire suite of authoring tools, and one of those tools that you're going to get is a, uh, a player and uh, so let's let's uh, open up that player and let's see how the uh, sound how the file sounds that we just created.
So I've opened up the MPEG H production format player. That is the tool that we can use in order to check if everything is actually playing nicely, it, if it actually is, everything is working okay. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to drop our audio file that we've just created, this test buff, into the player. And as soon as we do that, what it will do is it will open up the plugin that plays the 3D audio. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't play nicely with uh, a Windows uh, screen that is uh, scaled. I'm sorry for that. So it's it's going to give me this white uh, borders here. Don't worry too much about it. But the idea essentially is that here you see the uh, environment, all the individual. You will see the all the individual objects, and uh, here you see the individual channels as they are playing in the Mbig H player. So let's just play that. So here we have all the position of the individual objects, and here we have the activities on all the individual channels. So it plays essentially nicely. Now the one thing that you might notice is that we had 15, 15 channels really that we exported, but there are 16 here. And the, the reason for that is because the 16th channel holds metadata. So, so don't be alarmed if there's a 16th channel playing. That is not something that you actually hear that that channel holds metadata. But we can actually see that there's some activity going on on channel number 16. So if Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to automate a little bit. So let's let's see if we can actually automate our sources slightly. So let's go back into our little project. If we want to automate a parameter, the first thing that we need to do is we need to tell Spacelab Ignition what parameter we actually want to automate. So let's open up the Spacelab Ignition plugin. And in the Spacelab Ignition plugin, in the reverb section, here we have a button that is uh, that says automation. So let's click on that. And what we need to do is we need to add a lane group in order to make that that parameter visible to the digital audio workstation. So let's add a link group. Uh, let's set that up. Uh, let's, uh, what, what, what do we want to uh, automate? Let's automate the X, Y, Z, the position data really. So we need to click on the position data and then we see the available parameters that have position data. Uh, what we want to do is we want to automate the kick. So let's, uh, let's add that to the link group. Um, and then we also need to tell the system which whose parameters these are. So we need to give them a number. Uh, let's uh, use one, two, three. That's essentially the three that we have right now. So let's let's press OK. And the final thing that we need to do is it's, it says L1, but let's just call it kick. Let's give it a name. And uh, that makes it sort of visible to the digital audio workstation what exactly the, the actual kind of parameter is that we, are, that we are automating. So let's do that. And that's everything that we need to do here. So let's go back into our Studio One project and in Studio One what we need to do is because that uh, that plugin sits on a bus what we need to do is uh, we need to add an automation track now if you're if you're depending on your digital audio workstation that, that will work differently but in Studio One you usually do that with an automation track so let's add an automation track here um, and what we want is uh, we want to automate on the bus one uh, an insert, the space lab ignition. Uh, here we have the three parameters that are available to us. So let's just, uh, I'm, and I'm just going to use an example here. So let's just uh, automate the, the, the X coordinate of the kick. And uh, that should be it. And then let's just automate, let's make it just very simple from kick, kick ends at, bar, at, bar, and at the end of bar four. So let's just automate it a little. And that will essentially move the, uh, kick from the left to the right. So let's just see if that's actually what's happening. And let's maybe just uh, solo the kick for a second. Oops, that's not the kick. Here's the kick. Oopsie. Uh, doesn't Soloing here doesn't make any difference. I need to actually solo it in ignition. Sorry for that. So let's open up ignition here. And let's solo that here. And I see sort of this kick moving from left to right. And I can hear it also moving from left to right. Let's just hear that in context again. And obviously if I do the exporting again, I should now also see that in the final MPEG-H file that I'm exporting. So let's just give that a try. So once again, let's do the same thing again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, let me set the cursor back to the starting point. And then let's open up the, yeah, that's a little small here. Yeah, let's open up the MPEG-H exporter. 
Here we are. Uh, we can leave everything exactly the way it was because we didn't really change anything. Yeah, everything is still exactly the same. And then let's just set the export. Um, and let's call that test2. I don't know. Test2. Save. It's now ready. And I'm going to play it. And once again, it's going to play through the entire loop. Um, I'm not going to hear that. And once it's done, it's going to export that file. And I should then have the mpeg-h in full spatial audio format on my, on my drive. And here we go. So let's go back into our mpeg-h player. Let's drop our test2 file in there. It's going to once again open up that plugin that's going to once again be kind of confused about the resolution of my screen. Um, and I'm not once again not going to bother that much about that. So let's let's just play and see how that sounds. And what I should see is I should see essentially the, the kick moving. And as you can see, these, these objects are moving. So we have now actually used uh, a stereo digital audio workstation in order to create a fully immersive spatial audio format with objects, uh, so an object-based format. Now, the one thing I, I'd like to point out is that you might have noticed that everything here is, uh, is uh, arranged on a circle. And the reason for that is, and I'm honestly not completely sure if that is a limitation of MBEG H or a limitation of the plugin, but it, what it is essentially doing is that this, it bakes the distance into the amplitude of the object. It's essentially the same thing that you also have, for example, in an ambisonics environment where, where, where you, you don't really have information about the distance. Once again, I'm not completely sure if that's a limitation of MBEG H or if it's a limitation of the plugin. It doesn't make any difference, quite frankly. Um, we wouldn't hear the difference. So, so it's for, for, the for the experience that we're getting. Uh, no difference whatsoever but if you have any more information about that feel free to post a comment in the comment section below because i would actually really be interested to know if that where that limitation is now before i close this video today there's one final thing i want to point out and that is uh if you want to know if your um export is actually conforming to the mpeg h standard there's also an info tool that you can download from the fraunhofer site once again um link in the description below same thing as for the authoring suite you can't that load, download that directly, you need to register and then wait for Fraunhofer to accept your registration and then they will send you a download link. But this, this info uh, tool essentially allows you to see if you are kind of following the standard and if you are compliant with the standard. So let's just have a brief look on uh, what we get if we drop our file into this uh, info tool. So here I have the info tool open and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to drop that in here and as soon as I dropped it I see all the individual information about this file, the overview, I see the scene summary, I see that I have 15 tracks in this file, um, I see the interoperability and it essentially tells me that it is uh, interoperable with level ID 3 or higher. So we have, uh, once again, uh, MPEG H has different levels and we are interoperable up to a level 3. I also can kind of check the conformance status if you want to know uh, if I, will, for example, would like to be able to play that on a level 2 system or a system that is capable of only playing level 2. Uh, what would I have to do? So let me just check level 2 and let's just gather issues and then I see essentially all the errors that I get and I would have to take care of, that, of those if, you, if I wanted to make my file level 2 compliant. Uh, that is a really nice tool, um, very, very handy if you, if you want to just check if your mpeg-h file is uh, doing everything the way it's supposed to do. So this is all really nice and I find it really exciting that you can actually use a reg your regular DAW in order to create spatial audio, so you don't have to have a particular digital audio workstation. Any digital audio workstation actually can do that, so you don't need to learn anything new. However, the, the last remaining question really is, is uh, what can you do with your MPEG-H files? And the, question, the, the answer to the question is at the moment not really that much, unfortunately. Now, on one hand, MPEG-H is a standard that is uh, applied in many different areas. So in film and video production, for example, it's a very common way to do 3D audio. And most of the video editing tools out there, in particular DaVinci Resolve, for example, have integrated MPEG-H workflows. However, um, the question still is, can, you, can these video tools also import 
Epic Age Audio. DaVinci Resolve, or Blackmagic Design, I should say, um, in one press release, they actually announced that DaVinci Resolve has the capability to import Epic Age Audio. But uh, for some reason, we have not yet found how to actually do that. Um, I, th I think that was a little bit premature that they announced that, but it seems to indicate that at some point, an import of Epic Age into uh, something like DaVinci Resolve is planned. And if that's uh, the case, then this is really nice because then it really allows you to use a regular digital audio workstation in order to create soundtrack for a video or a film that uh, that essentially uses uh, spatial audio. And you could even conceivably use something like DaVinci Resolve Fairlight in order to convert MPEG age into Dolby Atmos. Uh, that, that is something that you could do. But at the moment, uh, we are li really lacking those tools. So at the moment, what you can do is you can create your MPEG age files and then play around with them, but you can't really do that much yet, unfortunately. Now, this is really everything I wanted to say today. Thank you so much for watching my videos. If you got any value of that video, please don't forget to press the like button. If you have any questions or comments, please use the comment section below. Or once again, join my Discord community. Invite link is in the, is in the description below. And uh, with that being said, see you at the next video.